Hello and welcome to the cross-platform reproducible build session here at ApacheCon Asia 2022. My name is Mark Thomas and I'm a committer on the Apache Tomcat project. My day job is with VMware, where I have a very simple job description, and that is go and do whatever you think is best for Apache Tomcat. So I get to spend the vast majority of my time working on Tomcat. I also spend time at the Eclipse Foundation, where I contribute to a number of the Jakarta EE specification projects that Tomcat then implements. So I want to start by discussion, discussing what the motivation was for Tomcat to create reproducible builds. And really, it all comes back down to supply chain security. This has always been a concern, and it's been increasing um, as time has progressed. And the solar winds attack really sort of brought that to the fore of a lot of people's thinking. And in terms of supply chain security, what we're really looking at is, can I be sure that A, the software that I'm downloading is the software that I mean to download, and B, that that software hasn't been tampered with. Now, for an open source project, we'd look at that both in terms of the source distri distribution and the binary distribution. The source distributions are relatively easy to validate, whereas binary, binary distributions are a lot harder. So if we look at the source code to start with, it is theoretically possible to audit the source code. Now, that's a pretty big job, but if your threat environment is such that that's what you want to do, you can do that. You can also compare the source distribution to the public repository to be sure that the source distribution you're working with is the genuine article. With binaries, it's a lot more difficult. You haven't got anything to compare against. And reproducible builds provide a solution to that. A reproducible build is one that anybody can build, but the end result will always be identical. So it doesn't matter whether I as the release manager build it or you as a user build it, as long as we start from the same source code and follow the same recipe, we'll end up with identical, bit for bit identical uh, distributions. And what that allows to show is that the binary hasn't been built from a compromised source. And the way that works is that if I as the release manager build Apache Tomcat, I then publish those binaries and the associated source code. Anybody else in the community can then also take that source code, build the binaries and confirm that they get the same binary as me, effectively confirming that the binaries have been built from the source code and that my, the build environment that I've used hasn't been compromised. Now, exactly how many people and which people you would want to do that confirmation before you were prepared to trust it without checking it yourself, that again is um, a decision that you'd make based on your risk profile. Now, there are some differences when we start to look at closed source. In open source, you've essentially got the opportunity to validate both the source code and the binaries. With closed source, all of that validation is internal. So you as a user don't really have the opportunity to do that. You essentially have to take it on trust that the vendor is providing the correct binary. Now, that's really no change from what it's always been, but reproducible builds still do provide some benefits to the internal checks that the vendor might want to do. So for example, if the vendor wanted to confirm that their build system hadn't been compromised, one of the things they could do is take a, take a copy of the source code, take that across to a standalone secure system, build the binaries and check that the binaries that, that result are identical to the ones that their build system is providing. So it does provide some benefits to the closed close source community, but I'd argue not quite as many as it does to open source. Now, there were also some other factors that the Tom Tomcat project took into account when considering reproducible builds. The first one is the installer we provide for Windows. That's built using the NSIS tool, and we always do that on Windows, which means releases always have to be done on Windows. And the reason for that is, whilst we know that we can build that installer on Linux with Wine, what we can't be certain of is that the result is the same. We haven't got a sort of reassurance that some weird bug isn't impacting the build and somehow creating something that isn't quite right, which will cause users problems further down the line. With reproducible builds, particularly if they're cross-platform, we can confirm that the Linux build system builds the same thing as the Windows build system, which then gives us the opportunity to build on different platforms. The other question we had is, well, 
exactly how important is it that we build with exactly the right Java version? I mean, historically, Tomcat has always been built with the latest available release of the minimum Java version that that version of Tomcat is required to support. So Tomcat 8.5 is built with the latest release of Java 7. Tomcat 9 and Tomcat 10.0 built with the latest release of Java 8 and Tomcat 10.1 with the latest release of Java 11. But you know, an open question is, well, if I build Tomcat 8.5 with Java 11, configured to build Java 7 compatible binaries, how similar is that? Is that actually going to be exactly the same? Can, you know, can we use that in our release process? Now with re reproducible builds, we have an opportunity to answer these questions because we can do things like vary the Java version and see what changes and more importantly, what doesn't change. So how did we approach this? Well, it was the, the overall approach is pretty simple. Build it once, and we worked with the main, the 10.10 branch to start with. Take those build artifacts, move them to a temporary location, do a clean build, essentially build it again, and just compare the two. There are going to be differences. You find the differences, you work out what the root cause is, and then fix that root cause. And essentially, just go around that loop until you get to the point where there are no more differences. Now, sort of as an extension of that, something that we wanted to do was explore the limits of what we could do with this. So as I talked about before, that was looking at what was the impact of using different operating systems? What's the impact of using different versions in the tool chain, primarily different versions of Java or different versions of Ant? Next, I want to talk a little bit about the tooling I used. And essentially, all of the tooling was around, OK, how do I check the differences between these, these two builds? So first of all, you need a good diff tool. So that's just to compare when the files are different so you can find out where the differences are. Now, there are lots of diff tools out there. Um, whatever works for you is great. The one I use personally is Meld. I've used it for ages. Get on really well with it. Um, and it's available for multiple platforms. Um, that's great when you're comparing files. Things get a little bit more difficult when what you're actually comparing is archives, because to Meld, those are just binaries. So I really took a two-stage approach to comparing archives. Step one was, well, just expand the archive into a directory structure and then use meld to compare the two directory structures. And that would identify any differences in, in the files. What that didn't work for was where the differences were things that would become metadata in the archive. So things like um, any additional attributes that were set for a file. Sometimes they vary by operating system. Timestamp on the file, that was a, that was a big one. Um, and the order that the files appear in the archive. So meld can't spot any of those. For that, I used 7-zip. Um, not necessarily the most efficient way of doing it. I basically, I did it manually. I'd open the two archives side by side in 7-zip seven seven and compare them. Now, because I wasn't doing too much of that, um, manual comparison was a reasonable thing for me to do. If, if you tackle this in your environment and you've got a lot more of those sorts of comparisons to do, then you might want to automate that. And essentially, automation would look like use a command line tool of choice, uh, list the contents of the archive along with all of the attributes, dump that into a file, generate a file for each of the archives you want to compare, and then compare the um, files with all the metadata, and then you'll be able to spot the differences that way. And Finally, I had to use a hex editor in a couple of cases. First of all, for Java classes, Tomcat build process uses a tool called BND to generate OSGI and JPMS metadata. As part of that, it generates uh, module info classes. And we were finding that the classes generated were different from one build to the next. And in order to see what was going on, I had to get a hex editor. Also with the window binaries, not directly related to reproducible builds. We we're actually having a, a little bit of an issue with the signing tool we were using, and we needed to look at the binary to see exactly how the signature was being inserted into the file. And that enabled us to identify where the subtle differences were, and we could get those fixed as well. In terms of hex editor, I honestly used loads of different hex editors, and I didn't really find one I was completely happy with. Um, the only thing that I do remember is that the built-in hex editor on Ubuntu Bless just kept crashing with the files I was using. Um, so wasn't very successful with that. And I essentially just kept trying different ones and 
till I found one that worked for what I happened to be doing at that time. But I never really settled on one hex editor that seemed to work well for what I was doing. Hopefully you'll have better luck than I did. So but that's the tooling we used. What did we actually find when we started running through this process? Well, um, I'm going to go through pretty much all of the findings one by one. And each of the findings has got a Git reference. If you want to look at the Git commit associated with that finding to see how we fixed it, just go to github.com slash apache slash tomcat slash commit slash and then put the commit reference on the end and then that will bring up the commit for you to look at and you can see the detail of what we were doing. It is worth remembering that what we were working with was a moving target. This work was something that I did sort of when I had a bit of free time now and again. So it actually extended over the course of about a year and various changes sort of, sort of happened around that during that time. First of all, we moved to Java 11 for all builds. Um, primarily, that was to try and make things simpler for the release manager. So they only needed one version of Java. It also allowed us to align a number of the build tools we were using between Tomcat versions. We, because Tomcat 8.5 depends on Java 7, which is really quite old now, we were starting to see issues where a version of the tool we were using like check style, we had to use one version with Java 8 and a different version with newer versions of Tomcat with slightly different configurations. And it meant the builds were diverging a bit. So we took the decision to move every all the builds to Java 11. That meant we could have all of the build tools on the same version and it enabled us to have more common configuration files and build files between the versions, which just helps our maintenance. Some of those changes we made may actually have sort of um, accidentally fixed some of the issues I'm going to be talking about. I didn't actually go back and recheck whether that was the case or not. So let's look at some of these changes then. And the first one is to do with that tool I mentioned, BND. Because it's generating manifest files, we needed to configure BND just to remove the entries in the manifest file that would change from one release to the next. So things like timestamps. Um, they got removed, and that was just a simple BND configuration. Then we went on to look at timestamps within um, the files that were in the release, and there's actually quite a bit of work on this. And because those files get included in archives, that archive, those timestamps then become part of the archive metadata, it's necessary to ensure that pretty much all of the files in the release need to have a consistent timestamp. And it was at this point we started to experiment with different ways of building the archives. So the next series of commits are essentially all about fixing file timestamps. And it's a series of commits because we were looking at various things. We had nested archives to deal with. So in some cases, we create a class file that goes into a jar, the jar goes into a war file, and then the war file goes into um, one of the release archives. So we've got multiple levels of archive nesting there, and the timestamps need to be consistent at every level, otherwise the metadata is different, so the archives are different, which means that the releases are different and they're not reproducible. Uh, the Windows installer had similar issues. And we spent quite a bit of time looking at different ways of constructing archives. We originally started off with Ant's jar task. Then we tried sw switching to the zip task because we thought it would give us a little bit more control over the files, their timestamps and other attributes in the archive, but found that, that actually created more problems than it fixed. So we switched back to the jar task and where we ended up was using the jar task with the modification time attribute. Now, I think the thing to note here isn't that that is the best way to do things. It's more that as with any things in software, there are multiple ways of doing things and you need to figure out which one works best for your particular use case and use that. In our case, it was the jar task with the modification time attribute. For you, it might be something different. Once we'd got the file timestamp sorted, the next problem we came across was to do with the generated code. There are a couple of places in Tomcat where we generate, we essentially scan the source code, generate some Java code as a result, and then compile that, and then include that compilation result in one of the modules that ships with Tomcat. And what was causing us problems was that the process of generating the code, when it was doing the scan, it was putting the results into a hash set. That, that all makes perfect sense. We didn't want duplicates. Hash set was a good choice. However, one of the consequences of using a hash set 
is that the order of the elements when you iterate over the hash set is going to depend on the order of the hashes. And for different runs, the same element could potentially end up with a different hash, which means they could end up in a different order, which means you get a different result. Different results coming out meant that the Java methods were written out in a different order, which meant the compiler would write the Java class in a different order, different files, inconsistent builds, builds not repeatable. So the, the fix for that was nice and simple. It was a case of just switching to a linked hash set because that ensured that the elements, when we iterated over the hash set, were provided in the same order that we put them into the hash set. Uh, the next commit was just tweaking the way we used ant slightly. Uh, when we started out, we used a feature of ant that allows us to set the timestamps of generated files. And essentially, you set a system property called ant.tstamp.now, and that's set as a Linux time, a Linux time value, which is basically a, a large integer. However, what we wanted to do is make this process more automated and actually generating that from Java in an ant task or in a script was actually quite difficult. So we decided to switch to the ant.tstamp.now.iso property, which allows you, allows you to use a formatted date and time, which is very easy to generate in Java, but that just meant we needed to increment the minimum ant version that we were using. Once we'd solved that problem, we then moved on to line endings. And this was really where we started to look at building across platforms. And for these, I was building across Linux and Windows. Uh, Linux was the host operating system. Windows was running as a VM. There's a shared directory structure between them. So I could then just do my, use mail to do the diff across the two builds and compare the outputs. And all those commits there are essentially addressing consistent line endings. Now, if you asked me before I started this, I would have said, oh yeah, we're doing pretty well with line endings. Uh, the zip archive will have Windows line endings and the tar.gz archive will have Linux line endings. What we found was that there are a whole bunch of files we actually weren't forcing to a particular line ending. And that was, that was then causing inconsistencies because we do them on one platform, we'd get one result, do it on the other platform, we'd get the other. So all of those commits are all associated with getting the line endings to always be consistent. This next commit uh, is more of a housekeeping issue. When we've been working on file stamps, pretty much all of the file stamps for archives we were handling by using the jar task and the modification time attribute. There are a couple of historic places that we were using uh, the touch task to set the timestamp. And we just switched that over to use uh, the jar task and the modification time. And that just gave us a slightly cleaner build, more consistent approach, and a slightly shorter build file, which is always good. This next one is probably something that is very specific to the way Tomcat was doing things or is doing things. I said that we were using BND to generate the manifests. And the way that works is we provide BND with templates that it then populates. Those templates themselves have include files. Those included files have placeholders and those placeholders um, are intended for things like the current Tomcat version. And just the way we were bringing all of that together, we were using just purely BND features and that was introducing some issues with line endings. So what we do in this commit is recognizing that actually those files that have got the placeholders in, we've actually already got versions that the builders created for other reasons of those files with the re version replacement done with the correct line endings that we can then include appropriately. So this commit is essentially switching over to using those files. Uh, the next one was a bit more of a fun one. Um, so when archives are generated, the files appear in the archive pretty much in the order that the file system returns and when the archive task asks for a list of files. And what we found was that in a couple of cases, the orders the files were being returned in were different depending on the operating system. And generally, this was happening in our test cases. We'd have a file, and I call it test.jsp, that was originally written to go with a unit test. And at some point, the test was expanded, and we'd create test2.jsp. All good. However, Linux would return them in one order, and Windows would return them in the other. So we'd get file, or we get test.jsp, test2.jsp on one operating system and test2.jsp, test.jsp on the other. 
Now, we could have spent some time um, digging into the ANT task, possibly either getting a bug, a bug reported against ANT and the uh, ANT jar task behavior changed, um, or we could have written a custom task or found some other solution. What we actually ended up doing was we took a much simpler approach, was just rename the files. So we then called them test1.jsp and test2.jsp, and then both operating systems returned them the same way. And that was by far the quickest solution to the problem. Uh, the next issue we had to tackle was to do with Javadoc. When Java, the Javadoc um, utility runs and it generates the Javadoc for your project, then it creates some supporting framework. So it's it's all the, the sort of the standard pages that go around it. And there's also some JavaScript that's involved in that as well. And in the version I was testing with, that JavaScript was being generated, zipped up into a zip file, and then added to the Javadoc output. The problem was that the files in the zip file had current timestamps. They weren't fixed, and the Javadoc provided no way to fix them. So this commit addresses that by essentially scanning the Javadoc output, finding those files, unpacking them, fixing the timestamps, zipping them back up, and putting them back into the Javadoc. That way, the timestamps are always consistent. I've obviously mentioned BND a couple of times throughout this. We did find a couple of issues related to BND specifically. And again, they were all in the area of, much like Tomcat's code generation was, BND scans the Tomcat source code or scans the JAR files, looking for various uh, entries that need to go into the manifest. It was putting those in hash sets rather than linked hash sets. And we had the same problem. I have to say the community was incredibly responsive to the bug reports we had with that. Um, they got fixed within a day or so in both cases. Uh, we did have to wait a little while for the BND releases to come out, but that wasn't really a problem. We would rather avoid using snapshots um, to build our releases because it makes um, recreating the build down the road much more difficult. So we we're happy to wait for the uh, formal BND release to come out. And because this was something that I was doing sort of when I had a, a spare moment, then actually waiting a bit of time for the BND release wasn't, wasn't a particular problem. We weren't working to any particular deadline. One of the advantages we get from using BND is for the jars that BND processes, it replaces the manifest that's generated by ANT. And that's good because the ANT generated manifest includes the ANT version, the Java version, and the Java vendor. And that effectively ties reproducibility to those specific versions, which is something I will touch on a little bit later. Windows binaries also presented us with some challenges. So for Tomcat, the Windows binaries are signed. And they're signed so that when you run the installer for Windows on a Windows machine, it doesn't pop up the big scary warning saying that this software is untrusted. Are you sure you really want to do this? It pops up the nice message that says, oh yes, this is official software from the Apache Software Foundation, it's all good. So we sign the binaries. Now for reproducible builds, that's a little tricky because what we can't do is just either open up the signing service or share the private key with anybody that wants to recreate the builds. So we need a way of every, everybody being able to sign these binaries, but without sharing the keys or the signing service. And the way we do that is with something called detached signatures. The way a detached signature works is you generate the binary, you use the tool to create the signature, and then instead of inserting the signature directly into the binary, the signature gets, in, gets generated into a file, and then it's the file that's inserted into the binary. What you can then do though, is if you add that file to the source distribution and your builds are repeatable, somebody else can take that source distribution, build the binary, they should build exactly the same binary as you, and then they can take the signature that you've provided and just insert it into the binary. And provided that the binary they build is bit for bit identical for the one that you built and generated the signature for, when they insert that signature into the binary that they built, the signature will validate and all will be good. Now, we had a bit of a challenge here because the ASF uses the DigiCert 1 code signing service to sign our binaries, and it doesn't support detached signatures. Fortunately, there's a tool called JSign, happens to be written by an Apache committer, Emmanuel Borg. Uh, that does do signing for Windows binaries. He added support for the DigiCert 1 signing service to it, um, and it supports detached signatures. It was great. 
Now we did find a couple of bugs in the signing process. None of them related to repeatable builds directly. Uh, one was to do with files being kept open. Um, and then because we happen to be testing on Windows, having issues with not being able to delete, move or rename open files, which broke the build, but that was quickly fixed. And the other issue was to do with when the signature was inserted back into the file. In one instance, it was padded to an eight byte boundary. In another instance, it wasn't. And just those few bytes of offset was enough to create the difference because it only needs to be one byte different and it will break the signature. So that, those were both quickly fixed and we were able to proceed with our signing our Windows binaries. A couple of other benefits we get from using JSign, because it's all written in Java, it's platform neutral, and we can include it as part of our build process. So it's not an additional tool that the release manager needs to install, it just gets downloaded as part of the dependence downloads when you do a Tomcat build. The other advantage is it doesn't require you to install the platform specific binaries that the standard DigiCert tools require, and it doesn't meet, you don't also don't need to do all of the sort of environment variable configuration either. So th those were some additional benefits that it was nice to have. So where are we at the moment? So the current status is that we have repeatable builds available now for all currently supported branches of Tomcat. So that's 8.5, 9.0, 10.0, and 10.1. However, for the builds to be repeatable, you must use the same AND version that the release manager used, and you must use the same Java version and vendor that the release manager used. Those versions, versions aren't fixed. They don't have to be specific ones. They just have to be the same. And to help people with that, uh, one of the Tomcat committers, Chris Schultz, wrote a little extension to our build scripts that generates a file that goes in the top of the source tree that basically provides you all the information you need to create a repeatable build and also sets up the ant properties. So a lot of this is automatically set up for you. So it's to try and make this repeatable build process as simple as possible. So what are we looking at in terms of future work? Really, this comes down to can we relax the ant and or Java requirements? As I mentioned before, all of the jars that don't use BND to generate the metadata have the metadata generated by ant. And that metadata always includes the ant version, the Java version, and the Java vendor. And that be behavior is hard coded. I have gone as far as looking into the ant source code just to see if there are any hidden configuration options that would enable us to exclude that, but there aren't. So it's looking like uh, we're either going to need to lobby the ant project to add some options so we can disable that or much like we did with the zip files for javadoc we'll write a utility that will take one of these jar files extract the manifest remove that version information put the jar file back together and hopefully give us a more repeatable build what we really want to work out is how far can we relax things um, is it going to be possible that we can just say, yes, you can build Tomcat with any current version of Java 11 and it will be repeatable. Doesn't matter which vendor you use, doesn't matter what version it is, as long as it's Java 11, it'll be fine. It'd be nice if we could say that. It would be even nicer if we could go further and say, okay, you can actually build with any version of Java from 11 upwards. Um, and as long as it's currently supported version of Java and you can you configure it to build for the right target Java version, so Java 7 for Tomcat 8 and so on, then everything's fine. And if we can sort of relax those constraints on reproducible builds, that would help the community because it would make it easier for them to, re to um, recreate builds. And it also re reduces the constraints that our release managers have to operate under. And with that, that brings me to the end of the presentation. If you do have any questions, um, I'd be more than happy to ask them uh, either in the chat associated with the conference or please do pop over to the Tomcat mailing lists and I'll be happy to answer any questions there. I hope you found this session useful and thank you very much for your attention.